The Prime Minister is desperately trying to garner support for this brand new Brexit deal. And he was in Northern Ireland today, which is where the deal takes effect. Ian Paisley is with me. He's the son of the founder of the DUP, the similarly named Ian Paisley, very distinguished figure, um, the Reverend Ian Paisley. Um, Ian, what do you and your friends in the DUP think of the deal so far? Well, thank you for having me on your show and congratulations on your launch week. I wish you well with uh, this new programme and with the opportunity for issues like this to be broadcast and dealt with uh, at some length and hopefully with some sympathy. Um, look, I I'm a unionist and I think you you've put it very well in your mogalogue there uh, about um, how a citizen in the United Kingdom, whether they, whether they live in the most western part, the most northern part, southern part or eastern part, are entitled to equal citizenship. And I, just because I happen to live across a short stretch of water, I pay the same taxes, I obey the same laws, I'm subject to the same government, but suddenly the 2% of the country is treated completely differently. Let me give you a very, very specific example. I have a huge agri-food sector in my country. Of the 20,000 farmers in Northern Ireland, we feed about 15, 16 million people here in GB. So we make a food with a food basket for GB and we send that food across here. If, for example, one of my farmers wants to take his prize cattle to Ayrshire or to Yorkshire uh, to sell at one of the marts, he's able to do that. But if he doesn't get the right price, he can't just put them in his lorry and bring them back home. He has to quarantine them in Britain because he can't take them to this part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, and uh, for, for at least six months, because the EU deems that Northern Ireland is not really part of the United Kingdom. It's part of their territory and cattle must be quarantined. That matter hasn't even been addressed in this withdrawal agreement. And yet farming is such an important point. I can give you numerous examples like this. There was a, you had a line there about um, medicines, and yes, that's wonderful for humans that we can now enjoy our rights to have the same medicines, the same cancer treatment medicines, and other important medi medicines that other people in the United Kingdom can have. But I agree, food medicines are completely left off this. They've been given a one and a half year grace period. Um, and can that then be cancelled at the end of the one and a half years, or will the EU continue it? Well, think? of course, the EU will then say, well, the grace period is now over. Uh, we want full implementation. And in other words, this affects probably about 50 or 60 percent of every single medicine. Now, if you're making agri-foods and if you're uh, dealing with livestock, those medicines are crucial to the success of your industry. And suddenly, if your prices vary in that and you're subject to seeking new, new drugs from inside the EU and not the ones which we in the United Kingdom can use, that is a variable on our meat product. And that changes things. Now, is this an attempt to destroy our very successful agri-food sector? Well, the only country that has ever blockaded milk made in Northern Ireland, butter made in Northern Ireland, has been the Irish Republic. No other country has ever tried to blockade our good foods. And so this is potentially having a strong economic effect on your constituents because it's trying to upset the economic union. So it's not just the constitutional union you're concerned about, but the economic union as well. The economic union is where people feel it in their pocket. Uh, if, for example... 80% of all of our trade in Northern Ireland. This little part of Ireland here, 80% of everything we do is done with our mainland island. Only about 9% is done with the rest of the island. Um, it's that 80% that is most important to us, and we want to keep that internal UK market alive and fully functioning. And uh, protocol didn't do that for us, it put a barrier. Rishi Sunak's uh, uh, agreement uh, is a done deal as far as he is concerned. And he thinks that he's fixed everything. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Now, so we're examining the text this way. We're not rushing to judgment. We're not condemning this. I believe Rishi is a, a genuine unionist. He's a Brexiteer like you and me. Um, but I do think that there are major issues here. And I, I like the way you started this piece tonight by quoting von der Leyen. The European textual documents on this are very different from the UK fluff that we have been handed over. We've got a lovely glossy statement. The UK textual documents do not sing this in the same, frame this in the same That's way. That's very important. Yeah. I think a careful construct of the two different um, papers may show that there are very different understandings. And the question is which one will be authoritative? If it's remaining under EU law, then of course the European Union one will be authoritative. And this uh, agreement struck will not be legislated on, I understand. So it's not law. It's a framework, it's a skeleton. And so 
What chance do you think there is of you going back into power sharing instalment? Well, that's a very significant question for the future of Northern Ireland. Um, my, my father sacrificed a great deal to get Stormont up and running. He is a passionate devolutionist, and uh, we want the people of Northern Ireland to have a say in, in their future. So, uh, whilst I'm caricatured in many ways by some media that uh, I'm hardline or. Not on GB I'm, News. I'm, definitely not on GB News, that I'm hardline or I'm anti the Assembly. I was a member of that Assembly for 13 or 14 years. I served in it, I was a minister in it, and I'm passionate about it. But, but we can't have unionist ministers in an assembly administering laws that are damaging the union and damaging Northern Ireland's place within the union. And it's really about this, not that you can't face being in power sharing with Sinn Féin having the Absolutely first not. minister role. <laughs> My father shared bar with Martin McGuinness. Yeah, but Martin McGuinness was number two to your father being number yeah. one. Yes, uh, I, I, I understand. I will address that point. Th that is not an issue. That's a democratic will of the people. If the people want to change that arrangement, they can change that at the next election. So that, that will change, just as the personalities will change. Um, so that does not stop us. We're committed to devolution, but we can't administer a process that will not only undermine our standing in the union, but will affect for generations to come their future. You, you, you're a proud father. I'm a father and grandfather, although I look much younger. You look much younger than me. Yes, yeah, amazing. <laughs> and I want them to grow up with the same rights and entitlements that citizens here will grow up with. Final thought. I came to speak for you a few years ago. One of you the did. biggest dinners I've ever addressed. It was an amazing atmosphere. And at the end, everyone stood up and sang unaccompanied the national anthem. Your constituents are the most patriotic people in the United Kingdom. What did you think about the audience granted by the King to Ursula von der Leyen yesterday? Well, uh, uh, I, I am a passionate uh, believer in the monarchy. I think it's so good for our nation. And uh, the foundation stones that have been laid by that, I, I hope, will reign for generations to come. Um, the sovereign obviously has to take advice from the government. And I think at times the government gives dodgy advice. And the sovereign should never, ever be included or uh, engaged in something that looks like he's engaging in local party politics. This is a, a party dispute, a political dispute, and we've got to see it as that. He is well above that. But, uh, so I, I don't blame him in, in any way whatsoever. But I do think the government should be smarter about those things. Thank you, Ian. That was a brilliantly constitutional answer. The king can do no wrong, but that doesn't mean his ministers may not give him bad advice.